It is a great honour to be here, distinguished guests, friends one and all. I acknowledge that we gather this evening on the land of the Wurundjeri people and I take Tony's words to heart, his welcome to us. I live in a part of Victoria on Wurundjeri land where Bunjil, where the, where the wedge-tailed eagle flies, not very often these days, but it's a source of extraordinary inspiration when I see that magnificent bird in the sky. It is an honour to be invited to speak with you on this occasion, this very special occasion in the history of VicSeg New Futures. I've only known about VicSeg for eight years when I came with the CEO of the Maya Foundation to visit John and Marie. And the person who told me about John was uh, Fiona Arney, who became the, um, the deputy director in the direct, now the director of the Australian Centre for Child Protection, who'd worked as a volunteer in the Sudanese community and who said, you really need to speak with John if you want to do anything in the area of early childhood and um, culturally complex challenges of helping our services become more responsive to different cultural groups. And it was very exciting to see John's vision, to see New Futures beginning, to see an organisation which had such a vision and which had such hope and which has such hope and such optimism. It was truly inspiring. I was also really interested that a whole family daycare scheme had been developed so that women could care for children within their own cultural groups and children could feel safe uh, with a common language and parents could relate to the care their children were receiving. And the training by sending VICSIG bicultural workers out into services like maternal and child health services and making those places more welcoming to the full diversity of the communities they were there to serve, but also helping people like maternal and child health nurses and other early childhood service providers become much more attuned and responsive to the needs of families from very different cultural backgrounds. It's gone from strength to strength, and now when I look at the number of people that are being served by this organisation, it's extremely humbling. I've seen the changes in maternal and child health services, for example, that have come about in part because of the work of VicSeg, not just in a geographical area that you serve, but much more broadly than that. It's like dropping a pebble in a pond and it's rippled out. Not so long ago, I was interviewing maternal and child health nurses for a book that Professor Fiona Arney and I have published, and I thought I could almost hear Vixie in the words of one of the nurses when she said to me, she spoke about a Karen refugee family who had been featured in a recent television program. It had shown the mother and her six children in an overcrowded refugee camp in Thailand, living in a tiny space and washing from a bucket, surrounded by a sea of other families. Then the program showed the family arriving at Melbourne Airport and going straight to a four-bedroom house in a new outer suburb. Her nurse remarked, it was going from poverty and community to affluence and isolation. I thought they were profound words to describe what was being lost as well as what was being gained. And it was that insight which I think helps those nurses today work in a deeply, much more deeply respectful way. When I was doing a study out in Werribee on first-time parent groups, I remember speaking with one nurse who said with great excitement in her voice that the best new parent group she'd ever run was one called Mothering in a New Land. And she had women from a broad range of different countries in this group. 
and they forged bonds with each other based on what they had in common. They were mothering in a new land without their own mothers here. And they gave each other much, much support. But it went beyond that. They then drew their husbands together on weekends and they shared the food and traditions of their different cultures and countries. And it was like she was describing a little microcosm of what a multicultural Australia could be like. In my own field of child protection, the picture is not as rosy. We now know from what members of the stolen generations have told us, the pain and suffering that has been caused to Indigenous people in this country by the removal of children from their families. We've also heard from other groups who have been deeply hurt by the way in which the state has sometimes intervened in its way to protect children. And there's no doubt that we need to protect our children from abuse and from neglect, but we need to do that in a way which strengthens families and communities rather than weakens them. So when Fiona, Arnie and I were working out how at the Australian Centre for Child Protection we would chart a course for our very new organisation. One of the first priorities was to look at how the child protection system was interacting with refugee and recently arrived immigrant communities. And we did the first study in that whole field in South Australia now some years ago. Parents from a broad range of communities were brought together and we spoke over weekends in their own language with interpreters about their experiences here. And this is what some parents had to say. The, one of the men from the Sudanese men's focus group said, parents feel disempowered in Australia being placed on the same level or table as kids, where there is equality between parents and children. And this puts parents in a very difficult position. In our society, there is a hierarchy. This causes the biggest trouble, as it is difficult for parents who were initially the head of the household to be on the same level of negotiating with the children. Participants in the Burundian and Congolese focus group said this, very powerfully, but my heart is being broken more than in the war zone, where we bring up children to respect us, grown-ups. Parents have power. In Australia, it is a different story. These families were struggling with adjustment to parenting in a new land. A Vietnamese father who had been in this country for a longer period offered this insight. The Australian way has influenced our own culture and we have adapted to this new way because of freedom that is available in this country. There is freedom for children to express themselves and schools encourage them to do that. Sometimes the kids don't respect their elders. We do agree with freedom to express themselves, but still have to guide them using our culture, and that can be difficult to do. Freedom of speech is difficult to accept, but we have to accept. That captures another part of that ongoing struggle of parenting in a new land. I was reminded when we did this research of a Vietnamese family perhaps 30 years ago when child protection workers with the best of intentions brought together in one room as a family conference a Vietnamese father and mother and their teenage girl who had been behaving in ways that had been making her parents very angry and on one occasion the father had hit his daughter. And I do not want to excuse the hitting of the daughter, but the way our system responded to that situation was deeply humiliating to the father. 
And because of the bringing together in that way, which put them on the same level and deeply shamed the father in a public government office, that family redrew the boundaries of who belonged in that family. And the girl was left outside the boundary of her family. The long-term consequences of intervening in families in that way are profoundly damaging. So when I came to be appointed to the panel on the Protecting Victoria's Vulnerable Children Inquiry, I was very concerned that we hear from families and from organisations who could inform us about better ways of dealing with these deeply troubling problems in families, trying to meet the challenge of parenting in a new culture and parenting in a new land. And we heard testimony, I won't forget the testimony of a young man from a Muslim background who'd grown up in a secular foster family of Australian-born parents with no religious tradition and how disconnected it was for that boy growing up in a family without his religious roots making him strong. I heard an Aboriginal man say in Sydney last week that if you don't know your ancestors, you are like a tree without roots. And this boy was like a tree without roots. And when strong winds come to trees without roots, they shake and they sometimes fall and break. And he was describing that experience. And that had led to the development of an organisation, Care With Me, to try to prevent that happening to other children. Vic Seg played an important role in that inquiry, putting its experience and its insight before us, and has played an equally important role since in developing professional training for people working in child protection and family support areas so that they may work in more sensitive and competent ways with families from very diverse cultural backgrounds. I have great hope that that will bear fruit. What has impressed me about VicSeg, looking at it from a distance over a number of years, is the way it fundamentally sees the people it serves. Not as clients or consumers of a service, but as contributors and citizens. Seeing people as contributors to their communities. If only all of our services could see people in that way, we would transform the way we work in our health, education and social services. The way in which VicSec draws on community members to mentor families, the way it draws on community members to mentor young people involved in the youth justice field. These are innovative approaches, which are again pebbles dropping in a pond and rippling out much more broadly than the geographical area it serves. The importance of being a contributor cannot be overestimated. The World Health Organization definition of mental health is this. A state of well-being in which the individual realises his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community by the way they raise their family, by the way they work in paid employment, by the way they work in a voluntary capacity as a member of a community and as a neighbour. This opportunity to make a contribution to others is essential to the well-being of each and every one of us, including children. Could it be that making the transition from being clients to contributors could offer the respect and dignity and true social inclusion which we are seeking for all of us? A friend of our family in the Quaker community in Melbourne is from a Burundian refugee family and we've got to know Guillaume and his family very well. 
In talking with Guillaume, who was highly commended as the Young Achiever of the Year in Dandenong last year, I asked him where his volunteer work started. He'd been here doing work on the Youth Ministerial Advisory Council, working with local young people in Dandenong. And when he told me, I was deeply moved. His voluntary work began in a refugee camp where he said, I was offered the opportunity to help in the children's program. He was only a young adolescent himself. He saw this as being given an opportunity and he's carried that with him. And he and the Young Australian of the Year and I were recently on a panel and as I watched these two young men speak about their passion for contributing to this community, this whole community, I thought how blessed we are to have them in our midst. It's important that young people remember their origins and are proud of their culture and proud of their parents when they are caught in the cross currents of which culture they belong to. I would like to conclude by quoting from a 17-year-old Bosnian boy who captures this pride most powerfully and gives us a glimpse into experiences of people who've come to this land through great adversity. This is from the book Dark Dreams, Zana Mujinovic, age 17. Despite all the humiliation my mother went through, she maintains her dignity. She is a dignified woman. She is a strong woman, but my brother and I made her even stronger. She knew she had to be able to fight to protect us and someday, with or without our father, provide a stable home. The strength she had, I've never seen. Seven days without eating, giving me and my brother the last crumbs she found in her pockets, drinking poisoned water and being beaten and still she managed to stay straight on her feet. It was admirable. It's that pride and that deep respect which this boy carries in his heart for his mother and which we need to ensure that children are nurtured to have. The courage of families who've come from such adversity to make their home in Australia is very humbling. This country is blessed by their contribution. Thank you.